chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and let me, uh, inside of our church bulletin, there's an outline for you if you'd like to pull that out and follow along. If you're a visitor with us here today, there's also a place in there for you to put your name and address. You can uh, give that to us as you leave. If you do that for us, we can have a record of visit. We would appreciate that. Um, how many of you are like me and you enjoy football? Do you enjoy football? Most of us? I enjoy football. Um, I've learned that I really enjoy watching my son play football. And, um, in fact, they, they've asked me a couple times to help out with coaching. And I said, no, I think I'm probably a little too intense. I don't know if I'd be good with kids that age. Um, I pace up and down the sidelines. But I also enjoy, at the end of the football game, if you watch football on TV, I always enjoy the, the interviews afterwards. Sometimes you can see some pretty crazy things in those interviews. But I've always enjoyed those. And I don't know if you know who this guy is. This is a guy um, who, his name was John McKay. He was a very successful coach at the University of Southern California, won five national championships in the, in the 60s and 70s. And then, like many college coaches, he left from college and went to the NFL. And he coached the Tampa Bay Buccaneers from 1976 to 1984. And he never really duplicated his success in the NFL that he had in college. But he, he became known for his, um, his after-game antics. He, he was really sharp. He had a really quick wit, and he, he became kind of known for this. Let me share a few of them with you. After the Tampa Bay Bucks played their very first game, um, he responded to a question. He said, well, we didn't block, but we made up for it by not tackling. Pretty good. <laughs> Standing on the sidelines during a game, he yelled at one of his coaches, we can't stop a pass or a run, otherwise we're in great shape. <laughs> Following another loss early in the season, he he, um, one, of the, one of the reporters afterwards asked him, what do you think about your team's execution? He replied, I'm all for it. <laughs> I thought this was great. After he had received some really harsh criticism about his coaching skills in the NFL that they didn't really match up, and so he said to these, these, these um, people in the media, he said, you know, you guys don't know the difference between a football and a bunch of bananas. And so in the next interview, the members of the media brought a big bunch of bananas for him and set them on the table. And so after that interview, he said, you guys don't know the difference between a football and a Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> <laughs> he was quick with his wit. I enjoyed it. But you know, I found out calling the game after the game is a whole lot easier than calling it during the middle of the game. Like they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. And when we come to 2 Timothy chapter 4, we see a man named Paul. And he's really standing in what you could call the end zone of his life. He's looking back over the game that he's played. He's looking back over his life. He's looking back how he's lived for Christ. He's actually sitting in a, in a prison, possibly the Roman Mamertine prison. And he's contemplating whether or not he actually left it all on the field. And so what we have here is kind of his final interview before his life is over. And he goes into eternity to meet Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll start in verse 1 and read down to verse 8. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. In verse 6, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and I love these words, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed his appearing 
Paul was a man who wanted to play the game of life with everything he had. He didn't want to hold anything back. He really did leave it all on the field. If I can continue with the sports analogy, he didn't fumble the ball. Um, He'd never been taken out by the enemy. And sure, he had stumbled a few times, like you and me, but he reached the end of his life with his faith intact, still serving the one he loved, Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've ever thought it was interesting. I I often find it interesting to look at gravestones. They call them epitaphs. I have a few I'm going to show you here today, just a couple. Um, I don't know if they're real or not, but this one says, I told you the milk was bad. I noticed you didn't have any. I don't know if that's real or not. I thought this one was good. Here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. It's bad. This one is actually a real one. Here lies Lester Moore, four slugs from a 44, no less, no more. Um, That's from old Boot Hill, you know, the old Western days. But if Paul could have chosen an inscription for his epitaph, for his gravestone, I think it probably would have been these words. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In this verse that Paul shares with us, He really breaks down the Christian life into three clear components. First of all, the battle that we face in life. Secondly, the race that we run in life. And thirdly, the ministry that we accomplish in life. And what Paul has to say to Timothy about his walk with the Lord really can help us in our walk with the Lord. It can help us tremendously as you and I, every day, get closer and closer to the end of our lives. The first thing he speaks about is the battle. He says, I have fought the good fight. That word fight, the words fought and fight, they they come from the same Greek word. And that word means to agonize. It means to struggle one against another for supremacy. Specifically, Paul was talking about wrestling. And, and, And however, while he uses this athletic metaphor, he wants Timothy and us to know that life is really not played out on a playground. Life is a battlefield. Life is hard. Life is a war. And if you don't view your Christian life in the context of warfare, you'll never be victorious in the Christian life because it's a battle. Paul talks, you know, the way he entered the war was through salvation, just like you and I. Paul entered the spiritual battle of the Christian life just like every one of us. He came to know Jesus Christ personally. You can find that story in Acts chapter 9 as he was walking along the Damascus Road and Jesus appeared to him. And and, and he knew, who are you, Lord? And the voice came back, I am Jesus, who you're persecuting. He came to know Christ. You know, before salvation, the Bible teaches that we were dead in sin. Ephesians 2, 1 says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins. We were not alive. We were dead in sin, the Bible says. But after salvation... The Bible teaches that we have a new nature, that we have the nature of Christ within us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. But the problem and where the battle comes in is this. It's that although we receive a new nature, although we get the nature of Christ within us, the man of sin that lives within us is never completely gone away. It's not just destroyed. And so because of that, we have kind of these two natures within us. This nature that is sinful, that wants to sin, and then this nature that is good and holy, the nature of Jesus Christ, that wants us to live a spiritual life. And, and it causes an incredible struggle. Read Romans chapter 7. Paul talks about the struggle that he had in his own life with sin. But Galatians 5 kind of gives us a real, uh, really captures it for us. He says, So I say, live by the Spirit, And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. How many of you have ever felt like that? Have you ever been in a place in your life where you knew what the right thing was to do, but you still contemplated doing the wrong thing? I mean, I've done that. Have you done that? It's because we have these two natures within us that battle against one another. But here's the good news. The good news is that victory is available in Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you, the victory is not available by simply turning over a new leaf. It's February 2nd. I can tell you the victory is not available in a New Year's resolution because we've already probably all blown them. 
The victory is only found through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul would put it this way at the end of Romans 7. He said, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Walking with Jesus is the only rescue. It's the only way to victory. So Paul entered the war through salvation. He had an enemy, though, in the war, and that was Satan. And and we all have a real enemy. It's not just a made-up myth to scare kids. We have a real enemy. But here's what I want you to understand. People are never the real enemy. Now, people can certainly be used by Satan in a lot of ways to fight against us, but they're really not the enemy. Paul says it this way, Ephesians 6, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. So we need to be careful to understand that we know who the real enemy is. His name is Satan. He is a master of deceit. He's good at his job. He disguises himself. The Bible says Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light, and that's why he's so successful. That's why he gets so many of us, because he hides his true colors. And he causes us sometimes to fight the wrong enemy. We fight each other. I mean, really, think about it. Somebody said that Christians are the only animal they know of that kill their own wounded. Isn't it true? This is, we're not the enemy. We do have an enemy. And we need to be careful. The Bible says, be self-controlled and alert because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Paul fought that battle. He fought that enemy in his life. But Paul had a seeker weapon, as it were. And it was his energy for the war. It was Christ himself. Notice, when he says, I fought the good fight, he's not really taking credit for what he's done. He's not puffing himself up like Muhammad Ali and saying, yeah, I'm I'm the greatest of all time. What he's saying is the success in his ministry comes from Jesus Christ. Like he said in Galatians chapter 2, I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul may have been the one on the battlefield, but his energy and his strength came from the one who lived within him, Jesus Christ. And you know what? That is an incredible encouragement to me because we do not have to face the battles of life on our own. Christ is with us. We can fight them in the power and in the strength of Christ. Here's what Paul would say. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We've got to find our strength in Christ, not ourselves. I want you to see, he also had some equipment in this war, and that was God's Word. Again, the battle we face is not really a physical battle. It is a spiritual battle, and our weapons are not physical either. Here's what Paul would say. The weapons that we fight with, I'll show you this verse on the screen. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. If you were to look in Ephesians 6, we won't go there, but you'll see this list of the armor of God, and there's one weapon, and that's the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. And so remember this, that the weapon, though, is only as good as the training of the soldier who wields it. In other words, when I, I used to, when I was in college, I worked on a golf course, and um, I thought this would be fun. Everybody else seems to like golf. I was in Florida, where everybody plays golf all year round because it's always 600 degrees. Um, so they play golf a lot, and I worked at a golf course. So one of the perks was I got to play golf for free. And so every once in a while I do that. So here I am. Now, I was an athlete in school. I could play, played football and baseball and did a little wrestling, played a lot of basketball. And I was always pretty good with athletics. And so I get out there. I figure, well, this can't be too bad. It's a ball. I like balls. And okay, I got a stick, but that can't be too bad. So I get out there and I start. And, and you always, you do this. My first one, you waggle up to the thing and you get ready and you hit it. And that first one, you feel like you've hit it a mile. You feel like, this is so easy. Beginner's luck, right? Then you take the second one, and you realize after you've swung that the ball is still on the tee. <laughs> and so I kept trying, I kept trying, and I tried to play golf, and I'm telling you, you know, I didn't take any lessons or anything. I was terrible, horrible at golf. 
I don't know how to do it. I cannot get that stupid ball to do what I want it to do. But, I mean, have you ever watched these guys on the Pro Tour? I mean, they smack that ball, and it goes right where, not all the time, but they, it goes right where they want it. They do, the putting's what kills me, man. They just whoosh, up and over hill and into the thing. They know what they're doing. You know, we have a weapon available to us. It's God's Word. But we have got to dedicate ourselves to knowing how to use it properly. We've got to make it a part of our lives. So there's a battle he talked about. Life is a battle. It's a struggle. We have victory available through Christ. The second thing he talks about is the race. He says, I have finished the race. So he kind of turns from the wrestling arena to the track and field event. He has in his mind the runners in the Greek games who were required to run great distances in hopes of being the victor. So he mentions first this track that's laid before us. When he talks about the race, he's speaking about the whole course. He's talking about the track with all of its twists and turns and all of its dips and hills. and He's talking about the whole thing, the whole race of life. Hebrews puts it this way. And by the way, just please understand this. The Christian life is not a sprint. It is a long-distance marathon. Here's what Paul would say, or the writer of Hebrews would say. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you would not grow weary and lose heart. See, the thing about the race is this. It's an individual race. It's not a competition. God calls us, each one of us, to a specific race. God calls each one of us to a specific life. God gives us each gifts, each differing abilities. God calls to a path in life that we're to follow. And it's not a competition with others. It's not like, I got to do better than that guy. I got to do like that guy. It's, a, it's an individual race. It's not a competition. And, and here's the thing. I can't run your race and you can't run mine. We, we just, we cannot do it. We can help each other through the race, but it's an individual race. And here's the thing. There's only one person to follow in this race, and that's Jesus. He sets the pace. I remember when I was younger, I've seen my son do this too. When I was younger, we would have these sprints in football practice. And I had this habit. um, I would, you know, when you run a race, you're supposed to look at the end and run. Well, I had this habit of looking at the guy next to me. I had pretty good speed, but I'd often lose the race because I was looking at the guy next to me. I don't know if I was afraid or I was afraid to trip or if, I don't know what it was, but I just looked, 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 and guys would pass on by me. It was never good. But when I really disciplined myself and looked forward, you know, I could often win a race because I looked at that goal. Jesus is the goal of the race. We've got to keep our eyes on him. And whether your race is long or short, we can finish well by walking with Jesus. You know, the race is sometimes difficult. Life is hard. Sometimes we wander off course. And the truth is, not everyone finishes well. But we can. If we'll keep our eyes on Christ and run to please Him alone, we can run the race set before us. But then there's a reward that comes along with it. Look at verse 8. What a, you know, he says in verse 8, Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who love and have longed for his appearing. The ancient Greeks used to run just for a a crown that was made of leaves and twigs and sticks, and it quickly perished. Today the athletes run for a medal that's made of gold, but even that will perish. But Paul looks beyond all that. He looks beyond his life. And he realized that there's going to come a day when he will stand before Jesus himself, the only one that matters in life, and he'll give an account, and Jesus will give him a crown that will never fade away. 1 Corinthians, I'll show you this verse, says it this way, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. 
And notice again in verse 8 those words, not only to me. Paul says the, the reward's not just for me. It's not just because I'm some kind of super apostle or super Christian. He says these rewards are for everyone who walks with Christ and loves his appearance. So there's a reward at the end of life for those who walk with him. So he talks about the battle. He talks about the race, and finally he finishes, he speaks about the gospel. He says, I've kept the faith. Now, when Paul mentions the faith, he's not referring to his personal faith in Jesus, although he certainly kept that. But he's referring to the whole body of Christian truth that's found in the Bible. We would call that the gospel, the message of God. The whole message that's found in the Bible is what he's talking about. Jude would mention the same thing. He would say, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you first to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. So he calls to mind at the end of this passage, this verse, how he had handled the word of God, the gospel message in the ministry that God had given him to do. Paul preached the gospel faithfully. He really lived out what he told Timothy to do. He told Timothy, preach the word. Be prepared, in season, out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. He told him that you have got to preach the word faithfully. Whether it's popular or it's not popular, preach the word. And Paul did that. You know, think about this. The gospel is the only thing that becomes more valuable as you give it away. I mean, the gospel is not just for us to keep for ourselves and say, well, I'm a Christian, I got my fire insurance, I'm good. The gospel is to be given away. The gospel is to be shared with those around us. It's not like some treasure we keep in a glass and we look at it and we adore it and we never do anything with it. This past year, my wife helped me fulfill a lifelong dream. I saw the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. <laughs> I did, it was a lifelong dream. I always wanted to see it. I was a big Weird Al fan growing up and I heard this song and didn't actually know it was a real thing. Then somewhere along the line, Google told me it was real. So I made my poor wife and boys drive a long way to see that stupid thing. But you know what they did? They kept it in this big piece of glass. You couldn't touch it. You couldn't get to it. You could just look at it, you know. And kind of, That's not the way the gospel is. It's not to be just hidden and put behind glass and looked at and admired because it's a wonderful message. Do you know, folks, listen to me. It is the message of the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, that changes people's lives. It's what changed my life when I was 19 years old. It, it, like this first song we sung, it was, it was the love that Christ had for me when he died on that cross. That changed my life. And that's what can change people's lives. And Paul preached it faithfully. He told people about Christ. He preached about them. He told them. One of my life verses is 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2, it says, I've resolved not to know anything while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Could you imagine what could happen if the church of Jesus Christ on this earth just got sold out to Jesus alone? Pushed all the other things aside and just preach Christ. Could you imagine the impact we could make if we just made Jesus the center of everything we do? That's why Paul lived his life. And so here's the thing. If all we ever do is keep the gospel under lock and key and keep it in this room and we don't ever share it, folks, it really benefits no one. But if we'll become active in giving away the gospel, sharing our stories of how God worked in our lives with others, you know what will happen? It will bring new life and purpose to our lives. It will bring new life and purpose to the church. Do you know, if you do any reading at all about churches that really make an impact on their community, there is always, always, always a strong emphasis on sharing the gospel with their community. The gospel is what it's about. We need to preach the gospel faithfully like Paul did. But you know what? He also lived out the gospel faithfully. He reached the end of his life, and he was still with Jesus. He was clinging to Jesus with his whole heart. And through all the battles that he had faced, though they were lonely at times, though I'm sure he felt discouraged, 
He never fell out of love with Jesus. I mean, he was facing death. He was sitting in a prison cell. And yet he still held true to his relationship with Christ. So what does that teach us? That teaches us, you know what, in life we face difficulties. I, I wish you could just tell people, here's what the gospel is. It's kind of this magic wand that if I wave it over you, all your problems will go away. Could you imagine how the church would be packed if that was the case? But that's not the truth of life. Life is tough. We face battles. It's, there's difficulties. But in spite of what God calls us to face in this life, we have to understand that we can walk with Jesus. Paul put it this way. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Here's what he's saying. If we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, if we look to him while we run the race of life, we'll reach the end zone of our lives and be able to say like Paul, I have kept the faith. Let me share these last few thoughts. The Bible says in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. I understand that verse so personally because I'm really good at starting things. I have not always been good at finishing things. How many of you have ever done that? You're, good, you're just good at starting stuff, but you're not always... Very practical wisdom, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. And so my question to us today is this. What would you like for your gravestone to say? What would you like for your epitaph to be? As we stand at the end of our lives one day, will we be able to look back and to say with Paul, you know what? I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. The truth is, listen folks, life is a battle. Are you in it? Or have you already given up? Life is a long distance race. It's not a sprint. And the most important thing I want to ask you today is this. Has the gospel changed your life? You may have your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Has the gospel changed your life? The message of Jesus Christ who came, lived a sinless life, was crucified in your place for your sins, who rose again and offers a free gift of salvation through faith in Him. Has that message changed your life? Not religion, but the message of the grace of God. That you can have new life in Christ. I was 19 when God changed my life with that message. And I wonder today, how many here today would say, you know what, Pastor, I know it. I know that that message, I know that Christ has changed my life, and I'm not ashamed of it. Would you slip your hand up in the air so I can see it? Thank you. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much. I wonder today if there's one or two who might say, you know what, I'm really not sure. I don't know where I stand with God. If my life were to end, if I was to stand before him, I don't know what I'd say. I'm really not sure. But I'd like to know more about this thing called the gospel. I'd like to know more about Christ. I'm just not sure today, but I'd like to know more. Would you just slip your hand up so I can pray for you? Is anybody like that today? God bless you. I see that hand. Or others who just say, I just don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I stand with God. I want you to know Christ died for your sins. Christ died to give you new life. And you can know him. You can have eternal life. Your life can be changed by the message of the gospel of Christ. If you'll put your faith in him. In just a moment, we're going to have communion together. But before we do, I'd like you just to keep your heads bowed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about the importance of examining ourselves before we eat of the bread and drink from the cup. So what I'd like you to do is just take a moment to, in your own heart and mind, examine yourself. Is there anything that stands between you and Jesus today?